Mr. President. Senator from Rhode Island. Thank you, Mr. President. Last week, I came to the floor and spoke about our nation's military and intelligence leaders acknowledging, along with our nation's scientific leaders, the clear evidence that carbon pollution is changing our climate. Unfortunately, there continues to be some confusion among many Americans regarding the clear scientific consensus, but that is confusion caused by deliberate and coordinated attempts to mislead the American people. For more than two decades now, the climate denial movement has been well organized and funded by the fossil fuel industry and conservative ideologues and foundations. The mission of these paid-for deniers is to manufacture uncertainty, to manufacture doubt, so the polluters can keep on polluting. This isn't a new strategy. We've seen self-serving strategies like this before. These strategies questioned the merits of requiring seat belts in cars. They questioned CFCs causing deterioration of the ozone layer. They questioned the toxics of, toxic effects of lead exposure for children. They questioned whether tobacco was really bad for you. Same strategy to manufacture doubt, often actually the same cast of characters involved. While the Congress of the United States has been distracted and deceived by these ploys, climate change marches on. The laws of chemistry and the laws of physics don't care about the nonsense we're up to in this building. They do what the laws of chemistry and physics say. Precious time is wasting. In the balance hang lives and jobs. This nonsense has gone on long enough. The public is being misled. Special interest dollars pull the strings of sophisticated campaigns to give the public the impression that there is a real scientific debate regarding whether or not climate change is happening. Well, there isn't. There just isn't. The real scientific debate is about how bad the changes will be. Uh, here's one example out of my home state's Warwick Beacon uh, in an article entitled Sandy, a wake-up call to climate change. It describes the head of our Coastal Resources Management Council uh, saying, I can, he's talking about sea level rise, and here's what he says, I can tell you that it is real. I can't tell you how, hang on, I'm gonna need my glasses to see this one. I can tell you that it is real, I can't tell you how fast or how bad it is. That's what I said. The real scientific debate is actually about how bad the changes are going to be. To manufacture doubt, to allow the polluters to keep polluting, skeptics with little training in climate science are promoted as experts. Front groups such as the Global Climate Coalition, Information Council for the Environment, Heartland Institute, Annapolis Center and Cooler Heads Coalition are created or enlisted to propagate this message of doubt. Deniers question the motives and engage in harassment of the real credentialed climate scientists. Well, for the record, there has been scientific debate regarding climate change. Ideas have been tested, theories have been ventured, and the evidence keeps coming back to the same conclusion. Increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from human-related sources is strengthening the greenhouse effect, adding to recent warming, and acidifying the oceans. Actually, the evidence coming in tends to confirm the worst and most dangerous projections. Uh, Mr. President, may I ask, interrupt my remarks and ask unanimous consent that morning business be extended until 2 p.m. with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each? Without objection. And may I ask unanimous consent that that exchange be moved to the beginning or the end of my remarks so they're uninterrupted? Without tonight. objection. Thank you. Claims, for instance, that solar activity is causing recent global warming, and even about whether the atmosphere is really warming, have been settled. 
But when the scientific research doesn't work out for the skeptics, they turn to straw man arguments. One straw man is that extreme weather events such as hurricanes and droughts aren't proof of climate change. Well, let's be clear. No credible source is arguing that extreme events are proof of climate change. But extreme events are associated with what has been staring us in the face for years. The average global temperature is increasing, average sea level is rising, and average ocean acidity is increasing. When averages change, extremes usually change with them, and a warming climate, to use the best example, loads the dice, loads the dice for extreme weather. So let's look at some of the other games that the deniers play to try to manipulate public opinion. One gimmick that they've reverted to is the observation that there has been no warming trend in the last 10 years. No warming trend, they say, in the last 10 years. In 2010, a Republican senator said, quote, I don't think that anyone disagrees with the fact that we actually are in a cold period that started about nine years ago. Well, let's look at the facts. Let's start with the green line on this graph. The green line is the global surface temperature data. It's not a projection. It's not a hypothesis. It's a measurement. This is global surface temperature data. And as you can see, it changes seasonally. Now, the red line that goes through it is the trend line that is mathematically developed from that data. That trend line is the product of basic and undeniable mathematics. And the trend is extremely clear. So let's look at what the deniers do with the very same data. Leave that one up. Let's put this one right in front of it. Here they take the very same data the green line is unchanged. It's exactly the same data. And this is how they get to saying that we've had a cooling period for the past 10 years. They pick a high point and they pick a low point out of this data and they say that's their 10-year cooling period. The problem is, if you go back, here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another one, and here's another one. Interesting how all the cooling periods stack up to an increase. It's a little bit like, uh, who was the guy on the radio? And he'd explain something to you and it didn't seem quite right. And then he'd say, but Paul Harvey, what's the rest of the story? So the rest of the story is that if you pick one piece of data out of a line that's going like this, and then you go forward and pick a lower one later, you can manufacture the hypothesis that there has been no warming trend in the last 10 years. But if you do it legitimately, if you run an actual trend line with mathematical precision through the data, it shows that this theory is nothing but misleading bunk. Misleading bunk, designed for the purpose of creating confusion. This, of course, this period is only a recent portion of the temperature record. When skeptics and deniers look deeper into the past, they find even more straw men, that the Earth's climate always changes, that it's been warmer in the past. Well, yeah, the Earth has seen different climates in the past. Not all of them ones that we would want to live in now, by the way. And the reason we know about these climates is because of the excellent work done by scientists. The same scientists who tell us that recent climate change can only be explained by increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then the final classic is that more carbon in the atmosphere is good because it provides more food for plants. The old plant food theory. Well, the fact is, we have changed the composition of our atmosphere, pushing the concentration of carbon dioxide beyond the range that it has been in for 8,000.
8,000 centuries. For 8,000 centuries, it's been, been between 170 and 300 parts per million, and it, for the first time this past year, touched 400 parts per million in the Arctic. To give you a time scale of what 8,000 centuries means, the practice of agriculture has been around for about 100 centuries. 8,000 centuries in this safe zone of carbon concentration of our atmosphere, only 100 centuries of those were the human species, even farmers. Modern humans began to migrate out of Africa 600 centuries ago. 8,000 centuries of this safe climate belt of carbon concentration, 600 centuries of our species leaving Africa and migrating to populate the rest of our planet. Homo sapiens, our species, appeared around 2,000 centuries ago. So we're messing with planetary concentrations of atmospheric carbon that go back four times longer than our species has inhabited this planet. In all of that time, in those 8,000 centuries, the Earth has never reached carbon dioxide concentrations like what we have caused now through human activity. Deniers also tend to just flat ignore the facts that they can't explain away or gimmick the data for. For example, the increased acidification of the oceans. That is something that is simple to measure. It is undeniably chemically linked to carbon concentrations in the atmosphere. So we hear nothing about ocean acidification from the deniers. But ocean acidification is possibly the most disastrous consequence of our carbon pollution. The rate of change in acidity of our oceans is already thought to be faster than at any time in the past 50 million years. Now, I was talking a moment ago about being outside of a boundary of carbon concentration in our atmosphere that has persisted for 800,000 years. Now we're talking about a rate of change of acidity in the ocean that hasn't been seen on this planet in the past 50 million years. A paper published this March in Science concluded that the current rate of carbon dioxide emissions could drive chemical changes in the ocean unparalleled in the last 300 million years. We are effecting changes in our atmosphere and in our oceans that only compare to ancient periods of geologic time. When you consider the implications for food security, biodiversity, and ocean-based industries, we cannot ignore these changes in our oceans. And just coincidentally, last Friday, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration proposed listing 66 species of coral as endangered or threatened and cited climate change as driving three key threats, disease, warmer seas, and more acidic seas. It might be worth reminding the deniers what NASA says, the National Air and Space Administration, what NASA says about climate change. Here's what they say about global temperature rising, and I quote, all three major global surface temperature reconstructions show that Earth has warmed since 1880. Most of this warming has occurred since the 1970s, with the 20 warmest years having occurred since 1981 and with all 10 of the warmest years occurring in the past 12 years. Even though the 2000s witnessed a solar output decline resulting in an unusually deep solar minimum in 2007 to 2009, surface temperatures continue to increase. On ocean temperature and sea level rise, NASA said, and I quote, the oceans have absorbed much of this increased heat, with the top 2,300 feet showing warming of 0.302 degrees Fahrenheit since 1969. Global sea level rose about 6.7 inches in the last century. The rate of sea level rise in the last decade, however, is nearly double that of the last century. And on ocean acidification, 
Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the acidity of surface ocean waters has increased by about 30 percent. This increase is the result of humans emitting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Let me say that again. This increase is the result of humans emitting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The amount of carbon dioxide absorbed by the upper layer of the oceans is increasing by about 2 billion tons per year, end quote. Mr. President, NASA scientists put a man on the moon. NASA scientists have put a rover right now driving around on the surface of the planet Mars. They are not the quacks. Our nation's best and brightest minds accept the evidence of climate change, and they are urging us to act. Yet still, for some in this body, the deniers carry the day. Why? Well, in a weekend editorial, titled Flight from Facts, Flight from Facts, my home state Providence Journal said, and I quote, the GOP is winning the race to avoid evidence. Some of this escapism, based on a desire to hold on to what had been comforting, if error-based, traditional beliefs, and some of it to avoid policies that might be economically and otherwise inconvenient. Well, whatever the reason, the price of our folly will be very, very high for future generations. One of the things I've noticed on this floor is that when it's a question of putting the cost on our children and grandchildren of taking care of their grandparents, ooh, how the Republican crocodile tears flow about that unfair burden on children and grandchildren. In one of their attacks on Medicare and Social Security, which the Republicans like to call entitlements, we heard this, quote, we have got a serious spending problem here and we need to have an impact on entitlements. If we're going to have entitlements for our children and grandchildren when they reach retirement age, we have got to change the trajectory. The minority leader, has also spoken about what appears in his remarks to be the health care bill, the Obamacare bill. And he worried about it, quote, creating a more precarious future for our children. The minority leader said about the stimulus effort to get our economy back on its feet, this needs to stop for the future of our country and for our children and for our grandchildren. When it's the deficit, he's urged us to make sure that we have the same kind of country for our children and grandchildren that our parents left for us. He's even talked about, and I quote, the Europeanization of America. And as a result of that Europeanization of America, whatever that is, I quote, our children and grandchildren could no longer expect to have the same opportunities that we've had. Mr. President, on virtually every traditional, anti-Obama, Republican, Tea Party bugbear, Medicare, Obamacare, the stimulus, the deficit, even this Europeanization of America, out come the children and grandchildren. Well, let's assume they are sincere. Let's assume they have a sincere concern for what we are leaving to our children and grandchildren. So, when it comes to big corporate polluters of today leaving our children and grandchildren a damaged and more dangerous planet, where then is the concern for those children and grandchildren? To have children and grandchildren pay for the care of their grandparents through Medicare and Social Security is some kind of sin or outrage. But to force on those same children and grandchildren the untold costs and consequences of the harms done by today's corporate polluters, what do they have to say about that? Well, for that, the future generation's interests receive nothing from the Republican Party but stony silence or phony and calculated denial. 
but the cost will be on them. The cost will fall on our children and our grandchildren of our negligence and folly in not addressing our carbon pollution. The cost will be on them, and the shame will be on us. Mr. President, I yield the floor. I note the absence of a quorum.